Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? Welcome to the stream. Very excited to be starting this new uh, show for uh, CoChess and CoChess.com. Uh, the show is called Diagnose Your Chess, and it's going to be all about uh, bringing people on the show, um, students basically, uh, taking a look at their games, talking about their chess, and figuring out like how they should improve. I'm going to be trying to give people uh, an actual chess diagnosis. So my first um, patient for the show is uh, Brayden. And uh, actually, Brayden, maybe you could just tell folks a little bit about yourself, like where you're from, what you're doing, um, who you are as a chess player. Sure. Um, I am Brayden Lachlan. Uh, some people may know me, some people may not. Uh, I used to stream quite regularly. And I've been playing chess for a little over four years now. On November 23rd was my anniversary, my chess anniversary. That's so funny. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I am noticing that I'm starting to have a bit of a stagnation in my play, whereas um, like I'm not improving as fast as I used to, which is normal when you get a bit stronger, but it's getting to be a little too slow where it seems like a halt and it seems like I'm just stagnating instead of improving. But I am a positional player, I think that's fair <laughs> to say. Um, I mean, maybe maybe you'd think differently, Kostya, but that's where I feel like some of my strengths are. A lot of my background when I used to study chess a lot more frequently as I'm now getting back into it after about uh, one and a half to two year break, is I used to study a lot of pawn structures and end games. And now I'm noticing actually that pawn structure wise, sometimes I play okay, sometimes I don't. End games, I'm playing a lot worse than I feel like I used to, but maybe that's just me noticing that I'm playing bad instead of before maybe I wasn't noticing. So okay, let's um actually let's take a step back. Did you mention where where are you from? Where are you living? Oh, sorry, Canada, uh, Ontario. <laughs> Ontario, and yeah. Uh, before the the pandemic, were there a lot of chess tournaments there, like in person? E yeah, um, not as much as I'd like, especially compared to the the U.S. There's a lot more chess going on there, but there's probably seven or eight tournaments per year. That's like near my area that I can I can get to. So it's when you say tournaments, you mean like um, like open events, like multiple yeah, rounds? like weekend tournaments and mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. And is there any kind of like local, like weekly club scene, like where you just wanted to play every week? Would that be like possible? There, there? there are um, the closest one to me is actually pretty close. However, I noticed, um, but after a year and a half, I was kind of just going five out of five every tournament and there wasn't really much to gain from it so i mm. ended up stop going or uh discontinued going to that specific tournament as i think i have a 14 or 15 game win streak from that place alone so i mean at that point it's not really challenging it's more like am i trying to gain rating or am i just trying to actually improve so yeah so and then you mentioned, so you learned chess, you said like four years ago, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are we talking about like learning the rules four years ago? Yeah, I didn't have a complete understanding of the rules. I think maybe I knew like, you know, pawns move forward, knights move in the L shape. I didn't know things like on passant, castling, uh, or that you can move pawns twice forward or any general guidelines or anything like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're just a total beginner. Yeah. Um, because I think there is a difference, like for some players that learn the rules and like play a little bit as kids, even if they don't get very far, they have it much yeah. easier later on when they learn because they already kind of internalized at least some patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and how old are you now, if you don't mind saying? I am 21 years old. 21? Yeah. Okay, cool. So you start at 17, now you're 21. Yeah, I still think you're... We're not going to get into genetics, but I think you're young enough that you're still like, you're still growing and your brain, I think is still changing quite a bit. So like, yes, the more chess you can do in these like next few years, I think the more uh, potential you have like later on. 
Okay. Um, and uh, what was your, or what is your Canadian rating? My Canadian rating is, I think the last time recorded was about two years ago. It's 1751 to be 1750. specific. So you haven't, you haven't played any tournaments in two years. Yeah, a little over, I think. Gotcha. And and when you were playing, how often were you playing? Um, I'd say every other month. I think I have a total of sixty games played over that span of about, I'd say, eighteen to twenty months. Okay, sixty every other month. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um. Cool. Yeah, it's just nice to get a sense of, yeah, like what you're, how you're <laughs> progressing as a chess player. And I guess you don't have a FIDE rating. I do. It's like it's like twelve, thirteen hundred or something. Oh, I see. So it's just one event. Yeah, FIDE yeah, ratings can from be like when yeah. I just started. <laughs> can be super, um, super weird. And you, you never played in the U.S. No. no. Gotcha. And okay, so. Oh, okay. Let's talk now. Like, what about your online ratings? Like, where are you playing online and what time controls um, are you usually uh, working on? I play mostly three plus zero, what most people kind of play nowadays. When I was a bit more serious about studying, I would mainly play either daily games or 15 plus 10. Uh, 15 plus 10, I was always told, is like probably the fastest you should go. And daily is just for trying to get a deeper grasp of specific positions. So if I'm having difficulty, I'll just play a daily game and just study variation on variation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, nowadays, are you doing much studying? Yeah. Um, most of my study isn't as formal as it used to be. I'm more so gravitating towards things like chessable, whereas before maybe I was grabbing a specific book and using a chessboard. I think it's a bit easier to use chessable mm -hmm. uh, nowadays for study just because it's just right there on your computer. You don't need a chess set. So it's just what I've been preferring lately. And what are you working on? Like any courses or For a while I more? was studying the 100 endgames you should know, and then I also studied things like the Alakine because I was kind of getting sick of mainline theory for a while. I also decided to pick up the Sicilian Taimanov recently. So I'm going through that course by Pintala Hari Krishna. So mm -hmm. that's, those are two main things that I've been working on. Okay. And then, um, yeah, I just want to get a sense of like, so when you were training before, um, mm -hmm. I guess more like over the board, you said you're reading chess books. Are there are there any chess books you've read like like a lot or you feel like were the most kind of influential for you? Yeah, so there are a few that I usually tend to bring up. Uh, chess Structures mm. um, by... Mm. I'm having a... Flores, difficult... Flores Rios, right? Mauricio? Yeah, Flores Rios. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way he describes pawn structures specifically is very intuitive. Mm -hmm. And it m improves your, my intuition. At least I think that's the way I should word it. But it just makes more sense uh, reading a book like that to me than something like a tactics. At least there are tactical um, books that I've read, especially one that was influential on me was uh, Training Your Chess Tactics Antenna. I think that one was crucial. I think mm -hmm. that's like what brought me to the next level at least and then there's also um mastering middle game i for we talked about this book once before mastering oh, we... uh middle game strategy i think it, something like that okay maybe you mastering had recently... strategy yeah that's oh it. the helstein book of course yeah yeah great one uh by grandmaster uh johan helstein mm. nice so you you're saying you read that book in full no, not in full. Okay. Um, it's a big book. <laughs> I so I I read a lot of it. I would say maybe a quarter, halfway through. And then I just put it aside as you do with chess books. Normally okay. you'll get like halfway, quarter way through. And then you just move on. It's like, ooh, new book. And then you feel 
a sense of pride because you buy a new book, but you don't finish it fully. So it's like, why are you buying a new book? You should be finishing your last one. <laughs> but yeah. Um, no, no, that, that is common. I mean, the, yeah, the book is like 600 pages. So getting through like <laughs> half of it is, is quite a bit. Um, and how about your, like your calculation? How did you develop like your tactics and, and calculation over time? So a lot of that had to do with training tactics. I would try to train tactics a lot. I would also just play and analyze my games and just see if I missed any specific tactics. And if I did every once in a while, if I'm really feeling like it, then I'll actually study those specific types of tactics to try to get more of a clear understanding of those types of positions. Right. Um, and nowadays, are you doing any kind of like online um, solving like chess.com or chessable or anything like that? Not longer um, ones like like a specific puzzle one at a time, more so like puzzle rush, things like to get or improve my, um, my overall pattern recognition mm -hmm. instead of deep calculation. And I think deep calculation is probably one of my weaknesses for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's not easy <laughs> for anybody. So <laughs> it's one of those things that you really have to work, work hard at it. Sorry, I might have missed it. Have you, have you done any books OTB, like trying to work on your like deeper calculation or anything like that? Yeah, that was uh, Chess Tactics Antenna by Emmanuel Neiman. Oh, okay. So that one, you felt like it really like stretched your, your calculation. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's um let's take a look at some of your games. So these are five recent games that you sent me. Um, these are online games, and the time control. I think they were all like ninety plus thirty. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, except for the Sicilian game, that was like mm -hmm. the one because um, that was, I think, fifteen plus ten as well. But I wanted to play against someone in a position that I was less comfortable with nowadays, just so you could see like, instead of positions where I try to go for something comfortable with, I tried to go for something a little different. Okay. Um, actually, that would be an interesting one to look at. Who, who was that against? It was against John Davis. Okay, let me pull that one up. Um... There we go. Oh yeah, this was a fun game. And okay, you mentioned at the top that you were feeling kind of like stuck in your in your chest lately. So like what do you think what do you think like is your weakness now? It's a lot more difficult for me to realize. I would say definitely one of the biggest things is actually just my energy, not even specifically chess related, but in some of these 90 plus 30 games, these are very taxing. Mm -hmm. Uh and very um, just draining, I guess is the best word to describe it. So sometimes when I was going, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, sometimes when I was um, playing some of these games, I would just kind of lose the thread. I would just get a little bit lazy or just tired and I would just either offer draws in maybe slightly better positions or I would just fumble something up, just miss a uh, tactic like in the eyelash game or the um, idea of playing that like F3, G4, which we'll see in the um, Ice of Opies game. No, not the mm -hmm. Ice of Opies game. Which one was it? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember like your opponents, but um, yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll try to get, get through as much as we can. Um, yeah, sure. I want to ask you, like, after you play one of these games, what's your typical process of, like, analyzing them? Typical, typical process is I look at the moves that I was least comfortable playing or seeing. So I think that's definitely where you can find the most instructive um, things to learn, at least. At least that's where, uh, where I learned the most is... Am I uncomfortable in this position? Should I be uncomfortable in this position? Why or why not? Mm -hmm. And that usually does not lead me too astray. <laughs> so that's interesting. And sorry, you're you're playing white in this game, right? Yeah. Not, not better for me. Okay. 
So take us through this. What was like the, what was the narrative of the game? Like, what do you think happened in this one? So uh, I know Bishop H3 wasn't so great. I I realized that B4, if I if he plays B4, I pretty much have to go all in and play something like Knight D5. Um, I think that's probably my best bet. Hmm. Unfortunately, they didn't play that. Um, I was a little less comfortable with this idea of knight d5 here because my rook on h1 isn't on e1 yet. So if takes on d5, takes on d5, takes on h3, queen takes h3, queen d7, um, then it feels like the king just barely gets away if rook h1, just king d8, and everything feels okay. I know I have compensation, but proving it is a lot more difficult here, mm -hmm. at least for me. So what were you thinking about this uh, during the game? So I I was a little unsure if I should actually go into this specifically um, if they played B4. Luckily, they didn't, and I kind of got a free pass. But um, looking back on it, I think maybe A3, a bit of a prophylactic move made more sense here. It's just difficult for me to play a move like that because you're playing on that side of the board, like you're you're moving your king side pawns. It's not always something you want to do. I'm a bit stubborn like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah, you can do it. I mean, it's definitely not always the right move to play a three, but yeah. um, in some lines, actually, it's like very normal because you're you just have to, you need your knight on c three, and so that's like that's the price we pay. Yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't quite get it. So with bishop h three, were you already like anticipating b four knight d five, or were you just gonna decide? When I um, had he played it sorry um yeah when i played bishop h3 i then looked at b4 i realized i played it a little too quick i should have just thought a little bit longer i definitely had the time to because everything up to this point was um up to my knowledge just theoretical mm -hmm. so i wasn't too concerned with the specifics of these types of positions because i already knew them but around here, I think it's a bit counterintuitive to keep studying theory after something like Bishop F8. I think you should just try to play the position a little bit more. But one right. thing I should have realized is I should also know what I'm supposed to do next. And I guess I just didn't quite get that here by playing Bishop H3. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I feel about these positions is that they're just super, super sharp. Yeah. And um, even if the engine gives you an advantage, it's like... It's worth very little if you don't actually know like what your breakthrough is or like what your attacking idea is. Um, so yeah, for instance, like here the chess twenty four stockfish is, is saying like king b one is good. I guess just okay prophylactic move. And then on b four, it does want to play knight d five. Um, okay. I'm so I'm not too familiar with why that would be. Only because um, I'm more familiar with when the rook's on e one. Just because then it's with check and the king's super uncomfortable. There's knight c six ideas. Yeah, um, no, I'm with you. It's it, it feels like a strange time for it, but um, yeah, I guess the when we work with the engine, it's like this is kind of what we're trying to figure out. Is like what are the exceptions to like typical uh, rules we might think or like what we would expect in a game? Because in a game, you wouldn't expect this to work exactly, but like yeah. the engine is telling you you have a big advantage. Then it's in like an instructive moment and like you should try to well like yeah why is it so so good here because yeah right intuitively it doesn't feel all that great necessarily but then you start looking into it you see like okay like let's try to make some moves for black bishop d7 point rookie one king d8 and um this is first thought is queen h5 and apparently white is taking on f7 and then maybe giving an 86 check. I'm kind of speculating. Um, not that I'm not saying that, oh, you should have seen this or anything. I'm just saying like, mm. um, these are the most useful positions to analyze, like when you don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you kind of focus uh, on these. It's a very important part, especially in the Sicilian, which is just like tough to play. There's a bunch of natural moves here for white that are probably yeah. not good. And during the game, it's like, it's not like obvious which of these moves are working and which aren't. It's just, just take, that's why these positions are so complicated that it's very easy to, to make a mistake and, and not find the, uh, the right idea. Yeah. 
normally for these types of positions, my thought process is if the king's on e8, bishop's on f8, um, and the e file is open, uh, specifically if there's a rook able to move to that very quick, knight d5 is always something to look out for. So that was just one theme I knew because I played John many times before. And we play a lot of knight orf games, a lot of these types of positions, and there's almost always a sacrifice on d5. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm glad you're you're willing to to go there and and make the sacrifice. Yeah, I'm not someone that sacrifices. These are the like the only positions I'll ever sacrifice material. So, good. But it's because you understand that there's there's going to be some compensation. Yeah. So you it, like it makes it worth it for you mm -hmm. okay so black goes bishop b7 rookie one castles okay, usually queen side mm -hmm. castling is not a great sign for black yeah and i knew just after this point knight d5 is pretty much just lights out so i just played it because it can't be taken now the e6 pawn is in a pin uh the queen's pretty uncomfortable if queen a5 a3 uh, this is an important move because if i play the immediate mm -hmm. b4 there's uh, ideas of queen takes a2. Not actually queen a3 check because the queen covers it, but um, after, yeah, knight d5, um, queen a5, a3, and b4 is a threat. And it's actually pretty difficult to stop. And the queen's uncomfortable, the knight's uncomfor uncomfortable, and yeah, white just has an overwhelming position. Yeah, that's brutal. It's kind of a typical idea, like b4, queen a4, you have knight, knight b6. Mm -hmm. and queen is just caught wow nice um so this is just crushing yeah black had to take he took but this is also winning in just a different way where i just take on e6 and then uh take on e6 again i i wasn't too sure if i should have taken on e6 or if there's something better i thought this was just strong enough where i can just make sure i don't allow something like an opposite color bishop game even though even in that scenario i'm sure it's completely winning it's just it's easier to mess up and uh, get into drawing positions, but I was happy with an end game, and so I just went into one. I see. Um, no, I mean the technique looks looks really good. Uh, I mean, my actually, my first instinct was honestly the opposite was it would be to keep the bishops because Black's king is um, just so open. Okay, on the Going light for, like squares. a more aggressive approach, yeah. Yeah, but but I, I think there's nothing wrong with what you did. I just think both are winning, so. Okay. Um, this is absolutely fine because you're, you're just winning the exchange here and your rooks yeah. are totally dominant so um even if they didn't play queen b7 for example queen b7 uh and i trade it's just completely winning like there's pretty much no hope in that position i'm up a pawn and an exchange and f7 is not even easy to take um plus rook e8 pretty much guarantees a rook trade so it's just rook versus bishop and an extra pawn and then um if queen b7 isn't played like queen f7 for example then the queen's just super uncomfortable it's just not going anywhere and i don't see how black can continue for example mm -hmm. so yeah after this point i just kind of knew i was winning after knight takes e6 yeah um and what was your time situation like here do you remember um 13 minutes on the clock still mm-hmm so yeah, it was like a 15 plus 10. So most of the moves, um, yeah. So this, I, he resigned after rook f1. Oh. Yeah. I think oh, this, this is was... just showing like <laughs> extra moves. Yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's like, I was also wondering like why you're not like, like C4. I was like, why aren't you just giving check and <laughs> <laughs> promoting the pawn um i see so this is a nice okay yeah this is a this was definitely a quality game i mean this is really important just for improvement is like being willing to to take risks and uh especially against like high rated opponents because your opponent's like slightly higher rated here right maybe not by much but... yeah like 100 points though i don't think that's um specifically fair because our match score versus each other is pretty heavy in my favor so um, okay so by this point you're like yeah not, i think it's just play styles of... like i think i have 20 
It's, it's like we have 40 games and I think uh, he won 12 and then I won the other like 28 or something like that. Okay. Um, so, well, let's jump to another game. I want to go to the game sure. that you uh, that you actually lost okay. uh, just so we could try to... Dalekine, yeah. That was a terrible opening. Let's see, wait, do we have it? Oh, I need to uh, copy it in real quick. Okay, and so in this one you're playing black, is that right? Yeah. This was during the middle of me kind of being sick of opening theory and wanting to try something a bit more offbeat. That, that's what happened in most of my 90 plus 30 games, or actually all of them, is I wouldn't play something uh, that was a normal main line of mine that I used to play. Rather, mm -hmm. I was just looking for a weakness in my opponent's repertoire and tried to see if I could do something about it. But in this case specifically, I wasn't looking for a weakness. I was just looking to play the Alakine because who studies for against the Alakine? Like not too many people. So yeah, I mean, I don't really love this <laughs> reasoning to be honest. Yeah, yeah it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> like because especially, was, I mean, these uh, are these are training games, so it's like yeah. you should be just playing the openings you want more experience yeah. with. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to play the Alakine, then play the Alakine. But <laughs> it's like, you know, even if, let's say for some reason your opponent has like a terrible repertoire against the Alakine and you want to like exploit that, like maybe in a tournament this would make sense because like you're actually playing for something, but in a training game it doesn't, like, yeah, I think you should just play your openings and uh, stick to them. Okay, um, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's a fair... Um... Way to put it. Yeah, because it's it's also not like it's it's very far from a guaranteed point, even if your opponent has mm -hmm. like a really bad repertoire because you have no Alakine experience. So you might get a decent position and then like not know what to do with it. Yeah. Um I did play a, a few blitz games like um for about a month in this opening already, but yeah, I definitely in tournament or longer game experience, absolutely not in the Alakine. So yeah. and you can see that immediately with moves like E6 and C5. These are just very silly moves that I've come to learn is just not good. And instead of E6, I oh. think I should have taken on E5 and then F takes E5 and the game continues. Yeah, I remember watching this game on stream and we were wondering because we don't we don't know the theory here. So I, I was like, is this like a known end game? It looks pretty like it looks pretty it's just bad. <laughs> bad for black. Yeah. <laughs> so right. So I guess that's the that's the danger. You play something you don't know, right? You can just immediately um uh mess up the opening. Yeah. Um Okay, but originally it doesn't feel so bad until um sorry if we just go a few moves yeah back. go ahead um originally like i knew i was on the back foot here i would say maybe around here after i played bishop d7 when i like i think a little bit after this move i realized okay yeah i need to be very very accurate or otherwise i'm just gonna lose mm -hmm. um and already some could argue i'm close to losing or just losing already uh, i guess depends on the person but it's our, yeah, it's definitely a bad position. It's hard to activate my pieces. The bishop on f8 is not easy to activate. The pawn on f7 is weak. Uh, the knight on b8, I don't really know what it's supposed to do. So, Right. Yeah, no, it's it's a tough position. But okay, I mean, opening accidents will happen. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like you fought back in the game pretty well. I mean, like, yeah, g4, you played h5, which was definitely good um i mean it, it felt like you, you you played the end game really well given that it was a very passive position and like really easy to uh yeah. to just collapse yeah um, i was just looking to make sure like all of my pieces were just slowly improved and just looking at like what's like the best option what are the best options i have to give me chances i guess that's just my my thought process because I knew I was worse. I knew that I couldn't be better. That's just <laughs> no sane person would think that. So that was just mm -hmm. uh, what I was trying to. 
trying to do here. No, but I mean, you actually managed to completely regroup and, uh, and, and basically like equalize, like with your rook on the H file. Mm. Um, I mean, you're still a little bit cramped, but like, yeah, yeah here some I thought of white's I had... pieces aren't, aren't that good yeah. either. Mm -hmm. Um, like I was trying to make some potential like knight b8 c6 maneuvers. I was just trying to find a good way to, especially the knight on, uh, c7, for example, um, the knight on d7, I think was fine for the time being, but I really w was just disgusted by the knight on c7. That's why I went for a6. I think that's probably the main intention is just because I wanted to go b5 because then it would actually have a role. So, uh, but why do we need, why do we need knight b8 for, or was this just because you're expecting bishop e4 or? Yeah. I see. And you wanted to play uh, yeah, b5. Yeah, I was just going too passive. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, things actually end up going wrong here, like super, super yeah. quickly. Yeah, I allowed this F, F6 was like the, like knight a5 um, was a blunder mm -hmm. for sure. Just because mm -hmm. this F6, I realized how bad it was. I didn't originally think it was going to be an issue. And then I realized I'm just losing the F7 pawn if I'm not careful, like with knight, uh, knight F3 to G5. So the best thing I can do really is just try sacrificing, taking on C4, for example, and just try to make things a little messy. Wow, so you're saying, yeah, bishop f8, then, like, knight comes to g5. Yeah, and I thought there's, like, maybe this isn't the best way, or maybe even knight e5 is better. I don't, I'm not too sure on the specifics, but I thought there's just no hope in holding a position like this. I thought, you know what, let's just rock wow. the boat, as, um, as some people say, so. That happened, yeah, that happened really quickly. Um... Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I know actually I know you're a you're a Berlin guy, right? You were talking about doing a Berlin series. <laughs> have do you wait, have you studied the Berlin? Uh the Berlin? Is that something you you've played already? Yeah, yeah. I have extensively studied it, unfortunately. <laughs> wow, fascinating. <laughs> I mean it's because yeah, you play this endgame like a Berlin player, just like is your king like lost its castling rights and you're like have no space you're dealing with this e5 pawn it's like very similar to berlin endgame you know like yeah kind of and i feel like you handled it well so that that seems like a good opening for you i mean if you i'm guessing you enjoy that endgame for black i play as white actually oh you like it as white yeah i well i wouldn't say i like it but i'm happy to go into it because especially at my rating i'm not um i'm not like an international master i'm not a title player Maybe I'm close to national master, but even then, maybe not. But the whole point is around my level, something like the Berlin Endgame isn't just a draw. It's not something where it's just, okay, why why are we going into this? It's something that's just still playable, has a lot of ideas still in the position that need to be learned by people at my level. So hmm. that's just why I'm happy to go into it personally as white. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, okay. Just because, like, no, just because I, I just think it's like a very technical endgame, mm. and you need a lot of like technical endgame skill to win it, and yeah. to take advantage of like 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 Black's mistakes. Mm. Um, so, Which I was happy to do because I, again, uh, a lot of my study was in endgames when I first started playing, so I was happy to play in game positions because that's where I felt a bit more comfortable. Okay. I guess that was my, my thought process behind it. So it's still in my repertoire. I don't play D3. I, I go into, I let people um, go into the Berlin Night game against me. Hmm. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's, um, honestly, it's probably fine. Like you, I mean, let's be clear. There's nothing against E4, E5. Like black is fine in every position. So if you find something where you feel comfortable, like yeah. actually that, that's okay. Because okay. you're not going to get an advantage doing anything against <laughs> e4, e5. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly, it's the opening that turns people away from playing um, e4. Like a lot of people, they switch from e4 to d4 because of the Sicilian. They don't like dealing with it. Um, yeah. But a lot of... Like the time and off. A lot of high-rated players, yeah, like the tricky Sicilians in particular are annoying. But a lot of high-rated players, they don't like playing e4 just because e4, e5 is so solid. 
and it's very difficult to get anything. It's like the Petrov mm -hmm. or the Berlin, like all these lines are really, really dry. But if you find something that you kind of like, you feel like you could outplay uh, an opponent of equal strength, you have some kind of edge there. I mean, actually, it's it's an interesting choice. Um, although I do feel like it might be might be slightly. Um, well, it's not a big deal. Not that many people are playing the Berlin at your level <laughs> yeah. either. So you're probably just dealing with more like mainline real opuses anyway. Mm -hmm, definitely. And and then which line, actually, I'm just curious, are you going for when they just play like A6 and they go for the Marshall or, or something? The Marshall, I play... Uh, sometimes I'll switch it up. I think pretty much all, the main thing that I've primarily only studied is A4. That's the one I feel a bit more comfortable with because mm -hmm. things like H3 or I think D3 is also anti martial um, They usually can give pretty much the same position anyways, but A4 was just really interesting to me because that is already a thematic move in uh, Rui Lopez positions. So, yeah, um, no, that's a good, that's a good anti martial line. Okay. So, yeah, this game was, this game was really interesting because, like, we, um, we got into trouble here, like, yeah, really unexpectedly. Um, so I guess, I guess knight a5, this was the big, the big mistake allowing yeah. uh, f6. And then instead, what should you have done here? I think f6. So if they're trying to play f6, I should play f6. I think I just underestimated White's White's plans, and I didn't even I didn't even consider f6 in these positions. So that's kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah, definitely was surprising that it could just be that that bad for Black. Yeah. Um. But well, yeah, f7 pawn ended up hanging. Um. Yeah, really interesting. Okay, let's take a look at uh, another game. Um, yeah, how about this one versus Kale? This was uh, your game against JJ. Okay. And you were you were white in this game. E yes. Yeah. So with white, you've been playing everything: e4, d4. Yeah, I just saw, I, again, I did something that you would not approve of. I didn't want to play a Sicilian, which I saw my opponent was starting to play. And I did not want to play against the Benoni because it doesn't matter which side. It's like Schrodinger's loser, where I will always lose from either side. doesn't matter if it's equal or winning. Like <laughs> Benoni is a tough one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, But... Well, with white, you you're an e4 player. Yeah, but then why don't you want to face the Sicilian? I just was honestly kind of tired of playing against, especially things like like Taimanov or classical. I I was thinking of maybe adding the Rosalimo. I think it is bishop b5 against knight c6 mm -hmm. specifically into my repertoire. But I just haven't studied up on those lines in a long time, and I didn't just feel comfortable in them, so I just avoided them. But I think that's the bad way to study is if I'm uncomfortable, should be studying that. <laughs> yeah, I mean no, but that's this is the point of these training games because like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, play I, it in these games so that you don't have to play it in a tournament for your first yeah. time, you know? Um, so these are like that's the one perfect... bad thing is I'm I'm bad with it in the sense that I always play to win, even in training games. I think that's a bad approach. Right. But that's just how I am as a person. I just don't like losing, I guess. So that's what I, what I tend to do. I think you just have to shift the mindset. You have to understand that you win... If you yeah. have like a really interesting game in the Sicilian that you learn from, win or lose, you win if you just get like an interesting game with with ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you win in training, anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think just thinking about your style, like yeah, it it does sound you're kind of like a like you geared towards a more positional technical side. Mm -hmm. That you would feel more comfortable in playing something like the Rosalimo and like some of the Bishop B5 Sicilian 
uh, positions. Because yeah. those are generally going to be more strategic than uh, the open Sicilian. But my whole uh, conundrum here is, okay, I'm comfortable with those positions, but also shouldn't I be leaning into what it, what's uncomfortable for me, right? So that's just the line I'm trying to figure out is in tournaments, for example, I usually only play things I'm comfortable with because, you know, ratings on the line, but for other things, then I'll variate and I'll just kind of uh, try, or at least I'll try to try things that I'm not too uh, comfortable with, but sometimes even here, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a good point. You know, right. A lot of players, what happens is they just feel drawn to the more like strategic side of chess. And then inevitably they just switch to D4 because that's how you get much more positional lines against everything. Um, and then you can be really successful with it, but eventually you will kind of hit some kind of ceiling where you're not breaking through. And it's usually because of the dynamic side. It's like you're like not able to find the right tactics. You're not able to like find the right sacrifice, not willing to take risk. It happens to a lot of players. I feel like I went through it. Like I was a D4 player at uh, like 2000, 2100, 2200. And then at a certain point, like I, I was just blowing too many games because I had great positions, yeah. but I was just unable to break through to just win like with some kind of pawn sacrifice, some kind of necessary breakthrough. Yeah. And Absolutely. Only once I like kind of developed some kind of feeling for the initiative, I felt like I was able to to shoot up. Mm -hmm. um, so it totally makes sense if you're already feeling like that might be a weakness for you, kind of like the more dynamic side, uh, that you would want to focus on that to kind of like bring it up to speed. Because I, I, I do get the sense that your positional understanding is, yeah, it's quite solid, which means that it's going to be likely your calculation uh, that's kind of lacking. Um, I mean, calculation kind of goes hand in hand with the dynamic side of chess, because if you're, if you feel like you're a good calculator, you'll have more confidence to go for risky positions because you yeah. feel like you can just calculate it out and you'll see all kinds of possible opportunities you basically, you become an optimist. You're just like, you see a lot of ideas and you want to go for it. You want to take yeah. um, the risk. Um, and yeah, I mean, is that what you're feeling that you kind of want to explore this side of of chess, like the more dynamic side of things? I think one of my motivations is to improve, and if to improve, uh, looking at dynamic play would improve my chess, then I'm happy to do it. So, okay. yes, I am looking to. I, I would say. I see. Do you have any examples of positions where like you you could have taken a risk but you chose you chose not to? Um maybe not out. in these games. Um in particular. I guess actually one good example is I don't play C4. I play the French exchange, for example, um as white, but I will not play C4 like the where you have the isolated queen spawn. For risks, I don't like giving myself IQPs, for example, uh, mm -hmm. unless I see something directly tangible. But otherwise, it's just not something I'm too comfortable with. And uh, yeah, making right. weaknesses in my structure, unless there's like a direct like win or something, is just something I will almost always avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah, we should we should talk about the French as well. Mm. Um, this is an interesting position here. Do you remember this one? Do you remember if you considered E4, for example, this would be, this actually be a good. I was, but again, IQP. So you don't want the IQP. Yeah, that's the only reason I. I... <laughs> right. So yeah, this is actually just kind of a classic example where, yeah, as a strategic player, we don't want to give ourselves this weak pawn, but yeah. dynamically getting the knight to g5, the knight to c5, I mean, this is worth a lot more. Okay. And this is like the kind of decision that, right, like, you know, our type of player, because I'm including myself in this group, will struggle to make, even though it, it's it's probably quite strong. Yeah. Um, so that's a, 
that's a funny example right off the bat. I'll, I'll tell you how I fixed this issue for myself because um, I actually, I had a similar problem where I was, um, I was just much more comfortable in closed positions and then that would inform all of my decision making. So if I had a choice between yeah. opening the, the position and not, I would most likely just not do it unless it was obviously good. Yeah. Uh, and then once I kind of brought this to my own attention, <laughs> then it became much easier to kind of correct for it because you know that you're going to have this bias yeah. and you can try to adjust for it during the game. So next time you have a decision where you can get an IQP, but your opponent's position is weakened and it makes sense to open the position, hopefully you're, there's like a little voice in your head telling you to explore that. Um, yeah. Or just try openings where I get an IQP that are okay to play. That would, that would be, yeah, like the fear by or um, solution by exposure <laughs> type yeah. of thing. Because um, if I know good positions in the IQP, then if I can just say, okay, this is very similar to that type of good position that I actually am good at playing, then, then I can just move to that. Yeah, it's very useful to have like a reference point. Yeah. Like I know what a good IQP position looks like and this is that, or this isn't that. So you know to avoid it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's really, um, that's really critical. Um, so what I did is I actually, I read fire on board Shirov's book, and this was really useful for me, um, because Shirov's play in particular was like the opposite of my style. Okay. Um, he was someone who just like always a risk taker no regard for like his structure when it uh <laughs> compared to like peace activity yeah and uh a lot of like from for me what felt like very speculative sacrifices he's like giving a pawn he's giving a piece it's like some vague attacking chances like i really didn't get it going through the games but then mm -hmm. you go through his notes and his details and then you start to kind of see chess from from his perspective and and then you start to see more opportunities for yourself to sacrifice and find that kind of like uh, speculative comp compensation. Um, actually, let me just show you one example. If I can bring it up real quick. Um, always found this game really instructive. Okay, I need a pen. There we go. Don't tell me he played e5 or something. <laughs> My opponent? <laughs> no. Uh, so actually, I was I was black in this game. Okay. <laughs> and uh, my last move was uh, b5. Um. And. Oh wait, knight d5 maybe. Yeah, this is what I was worried about in the game. Um, and then after a couple minutes, he he played it. Okay. Uh, my opponent is a grandmaster um, Ziska, um, who's a strong player. And um, yeah, kind of a tough, tough shot. Actually, let me flip the board so people can see it from uh, from Black's perspective, because that's uh, yeah. This is actually really interesting because the um, mm -hmm. there's like no tactic specifically. It's more so like it's. Just there's too much compensation, kind of like the knight d5 in my knight Earth game. Yeah. Yeah. Where I mean, like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. The, there's like the pawn on d5, it covers too many squares, and black's pieces are extremely restricted. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's like a very similar kind of thing in style to like other, other knight d5 sacks. And, and that's what happened. Like, takes, takes, bishop b7, uh, bishop takes g7, rook g8. And then uh, bishop b2. And um, 
I remember during the game, so I was calculating this, and I didn't like this position, but from Black's point of view, uh, <laughs> it was already a bad position. So, I, you know, yeah. what can you do? So I just played B5 and like, okay, if he sacks, he sacks. Yeah. Um, and, and then I was calculating some lines, like trying to figure out like what he's going to do from here and how I was going to defend. Um, so like I have some ideas maybe of just trying to get the queen out like C7 um, or B6 and then castling queen side maybe in some cases. Um, but I really wasn't sure. And uh, anyway, it's a, just a terrible position for, for black. I ended up playing knight B6. And, uh, and then he just goes queen e4. It's like a very simple move, just defending the d-pawn. And you 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 nailed it. I mean, it's just, just huge compensation for white. It's not like any immediate threats here. It's just black's position is really bad. White's bishops are going to be crushing, like bishop coming to h3, rook coming, rook h e1 coming, and then like f4, f5, or h h5. And uh, yeah, basically black has no, no counterplay. Um, and uh, yeah, I just lost like very very quickly here queen c7 bishop h3 so i can't castle king f8 rook e1 rook e8 no queen h7 i would be so tempted to play it <laughs> <laughs> yeah doesn't need it his position's good <laughs> f4 and it was that's it was a, already that's over. a very important move because bishop g5 right um yeah well yeah that was that was the threat so just very yeah. calmly playing f4 uh, I went rook g6, okay, hoping for f5, <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he goes h5, and uh, I think, I think I actually, I guess I wanted to play rook takes g5, that was kind of like my hope, but just queen takes h7, and now it's, it's all over, so we're just getting Oof. mated uh, with queen h6 next, and so game was over, and then after the game, I actually like, I asked him, you know, how... I was wondering, like, how deep did he calculate this one? And he basically said, like, well, just up to here. He didn't really, like, calculate anything further. Because it was just a matter of evaluating this position. Actually, like yeah. like you did. I, I think this is something that you already kind of intuitively uh, understand about chess, is that you don't always have to calculate every sacrifice out. It's a lot of times just about evaluating whether you're going to have chances and and then going there and then saving your time for for later when there is when there is something to to calculate. Mhm. Mm um so yeah, long story short, it would make sense for you to start trying to um well not necessarily like playing super aggressively or anything, but just like playing the open Sicilian and playing sharp openings and um well, trying to emulate the games of sharp attacking players. Yeah. So people like Shirov, people like uh, Kasparov, Tal. Um, I mean, tons and tons of amazing attacking players to to choose from. Yeah, I'm currently actually going through the Tal Botfinik 1960 match. Mm. So just like a game every day or every other day. And oh, just that's trying cool. to digest it all. Because... Who who better to understand craziness than Tao, right? <laughs> no, I mean he's the absolutely he's the guy. <laughs> to, to, to study. Uh, no, that book and like yeah, Tall's uh, Life in Games, definitely very very useful. And sorry, um, what was the one that you mentioned before the um, Shirov book? Uh, his book is called Fire on Board. Fire I would board, I would definitely okay. recommend that one as a as a game collection. Um, well, as as people may know, Shirov was of course like. Uh, I mean, he he worked closely with Tall, so his style or their styles oh, are very did similar. Know that. Did not know that. No, yeah, it's uh, well, Shirov, uh, Grandmaster Shabalov from who lives in the U.S. now, and they the two of them work together and work closely with Tall. So they're like they're the uh, the the representatives of like the Latvian chess school. Okay. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, brilliant players, all of them. Um, okay. So, yeah, I feel like we're getting we're getting a sense of um, of your chess picture. Um, there was a question in the chat: How many different openings does a player need under twenty two hundred? My honest take on this is just one opening as white, like meaning you just play e four, or if you really want to, you play d four. 
and one then defense. One defense like against it. both moves, yeah. So one opening is black against d4, one opening is black against um, d4. Actually, let's talk about your your black openings a bit. So sure. Yeah, what what are you playing, or what what do you want to be playing? So funny thing, I actually play the king's ending defense against d4. Uh huh. So I always play like knight f6, g6, bishop g7, like those types of systems, even against things like um, uh, bishop g5. So d4, knight f6, bishop g5, just g6. And if they take on f6, sure, I get a damage structure, but those positions are so hard to crack that it's it's playable. So it's, it's not like busted, for example. Um, and then as uh, as black against e4 c4 is pretty much the same story though so it's i just treat it like a more so a d4 opening i know i'm not going to get any i'm not going to immediately equalize doing something like this but i get a comfortable position that i'm happy with so that's kind of what matters um and then yeah against e4 i play Khan mainly um at least i used to so it went from e5 when i started out then i just got got crushed a few times and too many bad experiences playing e5 so i i moved on to sicilian and then i played against people half my age in tournaments and well why am i trying to out calculate like people that are like 10 years old 12 years old <laughs> i'm just not going to be able to so <laughs> i just uh i just moved on to caracon which is like more strategical and uh and mm -hmm. more like opinion or just thought based instead of like this move this move that move Mm -hmm. So that's why I definitely feel like I lost the sense of my tactical calculation because I was trying to play to my strengths and their weaknesses. So I knew that uh, most younger kids aren't going to know things like strategical play as much as they would know tactics. Right. I mean, yeah, again, it's this kind of struggle between wanting to be practical from like a results mindset versus yeah. um, right, just wanting to do the best thing for your chess overall. I think there is room for kind of adjusting the um, your choices and the openings you play based on your opponent. So if you want to have like a more like end game based repertoire against kids, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't blame you for that um, because kids are the future and we need every advantage we can get against them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would actually I want to make a YouTube series like how to beat kids and talk about like <laughs> strategies. Uh, because yeah, we're really we're really falling very far behind. Because um, yeah. they're not even bad at end games anymore. Now they're like they're just crushing in the end games. Anyway, so um, is Carol Khan your your main opening then? Um, I would have to say so. Okay. Um, I have been making serious plans and preparations to switch to C five again because I do want to play these positions that I can learn from. So, yeah, I would say uh, for now, it's still Karakhan, but not for long, I'd say. And, um, yeah, you mentioned you want to learn the Taiman of Sicilian. Is that right? Yeah, and I would I just like to study Sicilian positions in general. Like, there's so many just in the Sicilian alone that I feel like instead of doing something like Sicilian and Karakhan, I could just do... Sicilian and then like like a Timonov and a Nindorf, for example, and those are my two different openings. I see. I honestly, I think that would be a lot. I think. Um, okay. I feel like it sounds like you have a nice grasp of the Caro, and you can just. It sounds like you can just play that one whenever you want. I mean, it's not like an opening yeah. you have to stay up to date on. Um, but uh, and then I would just choose one Sicilian and and focus on that. I mean. In terms of just if you're going to be studying like a specific opening, when it comes to like Sicilian structures, like study everything. I think that's okay. that's just going to help you because lots of Sicilians, like the Taimana, for example, you can get all kinds of structures from the Taimana, right? So you still need mm -hmm. to know like the Shevengen structure and like some D6, E5 structures and, and so on, and Nidorf structures. Um, so nothing wrong with studying like middle games and structures, but I wouldn't okay. recommend like trying to learn a lot of theory, especially like something like the Nidorf. Okay. is so theory intensive that like if you if you want to play the knight or if it has to be like your only opening basically <laughs> like, yeah and that's just kind of how it goes and i mean you're at a i mean yeah definitely like an underrated level i mean for for 1750 like i think you can and should be trying to play against experts and masters right now um 
and some of which, yeah, some of them will definitely know some Night Earth theory and, and, and test you. And I don't know, uh, the Night Earth, I go back and forth on it because I think it's a great opening and I don't think... I don't think many people know that much theory on it, but like it can, it does get tough to play at, at a certain point. Um, but uh, yeah, if you wanted to choose something like the Taimanov or um, even the classical, I think, yeah, there are a lot of good options there. Yeah. Um, the King's Indian is an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah. Especially for my play style, right? It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the King's Indian is the opening that I learned when I was trying to, like, yeah, become a more dynamic player. Yeah. But you've already been playing it for a while. So do you feel comfortable in, like, the the Martel Plata variations, or...? Oh, I just <laughs> It's just perpetually uncomfortable. New podcast by Dren Johnson, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, just... It's just, I'm always uncomfortable, and I'm, like... It's one of those things where I know that I'm uncomfortable and I should be learning things, but at the same time, it's just so difficult to force myself to learn something in the King's Indian, I find, rather than something like an E4 opening uh, that I just have more experience in. And my results aren't even that bad, even when I get uncomfortable positions uh, for D4 Knight F6. So I just kind of avoided it for the longest time because usually... The best way to study is to go for the biggest weakness and it just wasn't something where like stats wise at least if i looked at my my online blitz games or something it was probably my best scoring thing to play even though i'm not so great with those positions yeah that's a curious one i mean i, I think the king's indian is a great opening i think like if i mean do you feel comfortable in it or or no mainline no um, when people deviate and I know that I've equalized because they just deviated and I didn't really change my setup, then yeah, then I feel fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, like yeah, when you're, just... when you're playing it online and people are just playing random stuff, like, are you happy with the, the King's yeah. Indian, like yeah. using the Bishop on G7 and yeah, I mean, I'm playing I... for like F5 or, or like C6, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if it's just like the main lines that you're kind of like concerned about, I mean, I think that's. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely work. Well, you just need to look at some games and, and feel comfortable in it. That that's basically the, that's how you kind of solve this, um, this feeling of uncertainty, is just giving yourself more experience and maybe just setting up some training games of exact positions that you feel uh, unsure about. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I yeah, sometimes like before a tournament, what I'll do is I'll just make some kind of list um and like a priority list and, and i just think about like what openings what i hate to see right now over the board that are part of my main repertoire because i know There's i'm a too King's many Indian player <laughs> well that's why you make a priority list so you're like what would be okay. literally the worst thing um so at one point for me it was like i don't know the the, the h3 line in the king's indian it was like driving me crazy like i i don't know what i'm so i had to like i forced myself to look at it because like okay this is the this is the thing that's like the most dangerous for me it's like a dangerous line and I feel uncomfortable uh, facing it. So then I worked at it and now I'm just like happy to see it. I like welcome it. You know? <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah. it's great. Um, so this would be something to do, especially if, yeah, you're feeling unsure about your repertoire because with black, you really have to be careful. Like you make one or two mistakes out of the opening with black, you just get a very, very tough position. Yeah. Um, and the King's Indian can be kind of unforgiving. Um, so yeah, I mean, to learn the King's Indian, the la latest book I really liked was King's Indian Warfare by Smirin. Um, yeah. Smirin is just a total boss when it comes to the King's Indian and he has a book of like super instructive games. Um, that would definitely be worth checking out. How did you study the King's Indian before? Um, honestly, I think a majority of my studying it i looked at some kasparov and fisher games for example um and i would just kind of like see like okay they did this idea so i'd always have ideas but i wouldn't have like antidotes to specific moves like in openings because again openings can be su uh, super specific especially in a uh, position or an opening like the king's indian so um 
I didn't really learn too much the the specifics. I was just more so interested in the ideas because when I started out, I did learn the specifics, but then I would just get into really good positions and then lose because I only knew the specifics, but I didn't know any ideas after that. Like how am I supposed to convert advantages or how am I supposed to even play end games? So that's why I had this drastic shift of like, instead of trying to look at positions individually, try to um, learn how to just formulate ideas and anything like that, that, that can be uh, useful for pretty much any position I play. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at your game in, in the French here now. Um, I think that, that was a good approach, by the way, to, to the King's Indian. Um, it's definitely all about the ideas and knowing what to do with, with the positions that you get. Mm. I think that's that's very critical. Um, much more so than, than the theory at, at most levels. Um, yeah, let's talk about the French. Why are you uncomfortable with getting an advantage? <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, you know, I just, I got burned too many times over the board and I just had to have this... Um, I've just been putting it off. You know, I just been thinking, you know, I'll, I'll get to it like next month or next week. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, do I, do I want to waste my time looking at a French defense position or would I <laughs> rather enjoy life? So I just, I just never got around to it. Um, and I just, I just played the exchange French cause well, it's a boring position. I'm fine with technical boring positions. So, you know, it's. Like, uh, if I'm having difficulties with other things, sure, I should be playing, like, something like knight d2 or knight c3, but I don't think it's the end of the world if I decide to um, play the exchange French, even though that's definitely a gap in my repertoire. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's a small gap. It's not, like, a huge deal. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, it, it will stunt you in some ways. Because, I mean, number one, a lot of players do play the French. It is it is a common opening. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that sometimes you will get a French structure in other positions. And you should feel comfortable handling, like, the, if you get a nice version of, like, an advanced French, where you have a lot of space yeah. and you have a lot of pieces. You, you know, you, you want to have some experience playing that kind of thing. It's definitely not a position to shy away from, even though the structures can be quite complicated. I think if you wanted to go the route of like trying to develop your dynamic side, then I would suggest playing knight c3 and then looking at the games of people like, again, Shirov. Um, Anand had some really good games in these lines. Well, there's always like these queen g4 ideas. I'd never felt comfortable with that as white or black. I think this is just too much. And mm -hmm. I just. <laughs> Do you mean the, the winner were? Or... Yeah, like um, knight c3, bishop b4, I think e5. And then, like, uh, eventually, like, just a3, is it bishop a5 and queen g4 or something? Right, right. It's like, something it's like, like yeah. c5. Yeah, there are a lot of weird lines here. I don't think you have to go in for the weird stuff. Actually, against the winner, where you could just go ahead and take care. This one is considered much more respected because um, black doesn't quite get as comfortable of a setup compared to the regular exchange. So okay. this is actually a very real option you can look into because you could use your experience playing the exchange and... Kind of handle it here. I think White's idea is like you go Bishop D three and then like Queen F three here, maybe Knight Knight G two. You can get some like annoying pull, but there okay. are other lines in in the winner as well that are like kind of more um, strategic. That said, though, I don't think Knight C three is totally necessary. I think Knight D two is just like yeah. so pleasant for White, especially at your level. Um, that I think this is just the the obvious choice. Yeah. Uh, and so one of one of the things that if I were you, I would just be excited about doing is just like downloading all the games of uh, Michael Adams in this position and just playing through them. Because okay. he's just like a fantastic player. He is considered like very technical and strategic, but I mean, I think almost all of his games have some kind of tactics or like tactical details. There's always stuff like under the surface, you know, there's like tactical points to everything. Uh, and he's just like, I mean, 
he just like a master of, of this line. Actually, a lot of the English grandmasters are really, really good in these lines for, for whatever reason, like McShane, Short, Howell, they like all have games in this. Actually, I don't know about Short, but a bunch of guys do. Um, so I don't know. I think this would just be good for your chess overall. Um, okay. And it might be, yeah, it might be like a, a gap in your in your repertoire or your uh, your understanding. I've slightly tried to play knight d2 a little bit more, but um, even then, you know, sometimes it's just it's just difficult to play positions that you haven't had any familiarity with, especially mm -hmm. against people of your strength. When, well, that's probably the only thing they play as black. So, <laughs> yeah, um, right. But that's that's kind of what you have to deal with as yeah. a <clears throat> as an e4 player. Is like your opponents mm -hmm. are always gonna. Always going to be playing their like pet lines against you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So. Oh yeah, actually, I just wanted to play through this game as well. This is another game. I think I saw this one live. Yeah, uh, just briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I realized looking at it, I knew that taking on a3 was extremely risky. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know it was just straight up bad because I, I saw some lines where it's like it's difficult, but I thought at best it's unclear. At least that's how I evaluated it because I saw these night before ideas and I know I couldn't take on a3 because of knight c2. Um, but I just thought there was just a lot of interesting positions where it's maybe not so bad. For example, queen a5, I just don't think works at all because I can just take on d5 and play knight c4, for example. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, one thing in my mind. And I thought queen a8 was really the best try here for an advantage after after queen a1. That's, um, that's something that was a little scary to me. Knight b4, I don't know. I just feel like maybe it was just inaccurate or something. I'm not too sure, but I just didn't feel so threatened from this because I just played rook e5 and the idea was maybe I'll take on on d5 with the pawn and also I'll play something like knight h4 where I don't really have to worry too much about that bishop because it's really annoying and if I don't have to worry about that bishop then I don't have to worry about the knight on c2 mm -hmm. uh, so I can just take the pawn interesting which uh, luckily happened though I think they played some inaccuracies there for me to just be able to equalize yeah yeah i definitely like um i think d4 i knew was bad i was uh, i think more worried of um what was it maybe maybe four would be fine bishop g6 um hmm it's saying queen a8 i didn't see that yeah, the engine finds some stuff like queen a8 and then takes. You could even go knight b4 or like. Yeah, just, I understand uh, queen a5 because you just want to take on d2, right? But um, here's just the a pawn is is very yeah. strong. Mm -hmm. Um, but I actually for black I liked queen a8 earlier. I think that it because knight b4 it might work, but yeah, it gets things like black is kind of in a shaky situation and wasn't yeah, able I just to like figure no it out. To exactly there's no reason to play something like uh, knight b4 when queen a8 is just like okay i can't get rid of the pawn there's ideas of bishop b1 sometimes but after a2 and like i can pretty much never touch the pawn so yeah this one would be really annoying yeah, yeah. like that's that's more so what i was worried about so mm -hmm. i i was a bit happier to see knight b4 i knew that there was still some pressure and i should be very careful but yeah, I thought that was just inaccurate. But why take on b4 at all, actually? I'm wondering about this decision. You know, I I thought it would be an interesting decision. And then, like, I, I'm not too sure why I wasn't too afraid of uh, a takes b4. It wasn't really too much on my radar. Like, I think, I think it was, like, the move I expected. Or ex I was expecting something maybe like knight b4, which are obviously only two moves there, but... Um, it's just not recognizing that it's such a big threat or big idea in the position. Like, I didn't see these 
rook a3 moves for example and when it was yeah. played then i was a bit, bit more concerned yeah it is a little bit unconventional but right like not only does black get that a3 score they also really hurt your knight on b1 it becomes mm -hmm. a really difficult piece because even on d2 it's still dominated by the the pawn on d5 yeah maybe i should have taken on a8 first and then play knight d2 maybe but yeah this isn't really right yeah, like what you would have wanted <laughs> yeah white's supposed to be the one playing for the advantage here not yeah like at least um, you know in the opening so so this was kind of okay this was like in the same game an example of maybe trading a little bit too too easily mm -hmm. i didn't really see this it is a typical pattern i didn't really see this in your other games that much but okay maybe maybe one small thing to uh to think about um actually i think we're kind of getting to the end of our show so i feel like we should try to wrap things up in okay. in some way um well, my feeling is that, like, I mean, you're on a really good track right now. I feel like you're doing a lot of the right things. You're, like, trying to play strong players, long time controls. You're analyzing your games. You're looking for your weaknesses and, like, seeing for ways you can improve your own understanding and improve your, your own play. Um, it, it feels like you think maybe a weakness might be uh, the kind of your calculation and your ability to play in like sharp positions and like take risks yeah. and go for the attack and that i mean that's a very common thing for players that are more like consider themselves like more positional and, and technical and actually for someone that kind of like joined in late um a lot of times you kind of feel like you're behind your opponents in terms of calculation because they've been playing chess for longer so yeah. like they're going to be able to like see more tricks but you're not that far behind that you can't just catch up and kind of like turn it into a strength okay um so i yeah what i would suggest is some kind of like really intensive uh like calculation training where you like work for maybe like an hour a day um for let's say four to six weeks maybe 90 minutes if you have the time and where you're just trying to solve like really difficult uh puzzles not so difficult that they're impossible but difficult the sense that like you know you have to calculate like 10 15 minutes and then maybe you solve yeah. it maybe you don't so not something like the woodpecker method then you're thinking more so on the lines of looking for more lengthier puzzles uh no woodpecker would be good if you um if you get the book and set up the positions over the board so like the ones in the easy section will be quite easy for you and then the intermediate will be like maybe half and half like, I think half will be quite tricky and the other half will be on the easier side. And then the advanced problems will definitely be giving you enough material that you can you can set them up over the board and calculate. And um, those would be, I think, at a really good, those would be at a really good level for you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I would suggest doing that, especially like OTB. So you can really try to like push your calculation. Um, and... And then on top of that, studying one player with a really sharp style. So in your case, I think just reading tall would be good. And then you can continue that once you're done with that book or, or move on to a different player. Okay. Um, of course, as usual, you know, keep playing games and analyzing them. Um, yeah. And play 92 against the French. <laughs> Play 92 in the French. That's the only opening I insist you learn. <laughs> uh, but other than that, yeah, like, I would say, yeah, don't bounce around too much in the opening. Rather, try to find the openings that you just enjoy playing and that you yeah. want to play every game. And that's, stick to that's an interesting one because, for example, um, I. I feel like I don't have enough understanding of so many different openings where I need to try them out a bit for a while to know is this actually for me or not. So that's well, that's fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, if you want to just try something out in like a couple of games, I think there's absolutely no harm in that. I mean, that's what the so the training games are for that you're playing. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how you take advantage during during these times. You just play a bunch of training games. They're basically just free free training yeah um and then once you find something that you like you you just work on it and you okay. make it work for you um 
And then once you have like a solid grasp, like like for you, like, you know, you, you might feel really comfortable with the Karo, like you've just been playing it for a while, you like the positions, and then, then you can feel comfortable moving on to something else. And then when you come back to it, you'll remember most of what you know right now. Yeah. Whereas example, if you bounce around yeah, too much, it's touched, hard to keep track. I haven't touched the Karo Con actually in a while, and I would still feel perfectly fine playing it. So that's one of the openings where like, there are some lines, for example, like these these crazy attacks G4 after the, the advanced, for example. Mm -hmm. Those I should probably learn because those are things that I'm not too comfortable playing against. Mm -hmm. um, like I don't have like an overwhelmingly negative score. It's just uncomfortable and I think negative score still. So yeah, maybe that's a good place to start as well. Yeah, I just mean like if you bounce around too much then it'll be hard to retain a lot of info versus okay. if you oh, yeah. like you know choose one opening like the time on of or what have you and then you um like intensely work on it then that will allow you to kind of um build around it and 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 branch out a lot easier so for me like i remember i was studying the king's indian and the time on of for like maybe six months straight like these were the only two openings i was looking at because uh, I was like completely changing up my repertoire, playing something new against d4, playing something new against e4. And uh, of course, I understood like, yeah, if I play this in a tournament, I'm going to be so inexperienced. I'm not going to understand anything. I'm not going to know any nuances. So I just need to like focus on it and like pound it out. And that's, yeah. and that's really important when you're trying to, um, well, you know, essentially learn a new opening or learn a new, a new set of positions. Um, well, cool. I hope, I hope you found this, um, useful and the idea here with with brayden is um we're gonna be back with a new student next week but we'll check in with brayden uh i'm thinking sometime in in the new year maybe in in about a month or six weeks or so and we'll we'll see how it's going <laughs> yeah sounds if, good. if we have any um any updates maybe we'll do a little bit longer because you it's hard to make a lot of progress in like four to six weeks but we will be seeing Braden again in the future, and uh, and I promise I'll have a out. I'll have an E6 repertoire. <laughs> <by then>. <laughs> <laughs> so nice, awesome. Well, yeah, thanks guys for for tuning in. I hope you um in enjoyed it, and thanks Braden for for joining me. That yeah, was a lot of fun. Soon. Thank you. <laughs>